Good morning again. Glad that we get to worship together and to be led so well by our choir and orchestra. Stephen, thank you. Uh, well done again. This is like, what, 200, 300 weeks in a row of just like excellence. Right on. So my name's Travis. We are walking through a sermon series on the book of Matthew. And uh, before Easter, we started out by talking about how Jesus is king. And since Easter, we've kind of looked back at the book of Matthew and some stories, parables, teachings about how life in this kingdom looks now that we have this king. And in the ancient era, in the medieval times, when you had a really good king, there was stability. There was comfort. There was security. You, you knew uh, that the economy was do, going to do well. You had rest from your enemies outside of the kingdom. Things were good. There was comfort and security, as I said. And I think we all believe that Jesus is a good king. So let me ask you this. Why am I so tired? Why are you so tired? Why are we so worn out? Why, if Jesus is this great king, why are we so worn out? Why am I tired uh, of work? Why am I tired of school? Why am I tired of the people around me? Not all of you, but some. Why am I tired of the, the, why are the people that I love, the people that are closest to me, why do I snap at them so much quicker than I did a few years ago? I would submit to you is that we are not resting. We're not resting, particularly in the way that the Lord intended us to rest. And so today we're going to talk about rest. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. We're going to talk about how rest is important for us spiritually. The spiritual rest that Christ offers us. And we're going to talk about what rest embraces, what rest elevates, and what rest encourages. So let's talk about the fact that rest embraces authority. Rest embraces authority. Verse 1, chapter 12. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. And he said to them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. So the disciples are on their way somewhere. The text doesn't really say where, and they're hungry. And in that day and age, much like today, Chick-fil-A was closed on the Sabbath So they had to come up with an alternative plan. And they start to eat the the heads of grain off of the grain fields. This was legal. It was allowed. They weren't stealing. But by some definitions of work, it's considered to be work. Now, this isn't going to be a satisfying meal for them. If you've ever been to Costco or Sam's and they have the samples out... And it's before lunch, and you're like, yeah, it's going to be a minute because it's Costco and we've got to buy everything. I'm going to get me a little snack. This is basically what's happening. This is just small food. And into this idyllic scene, the Pharisees come and say, you're breaking the Sabbath law. Now, everyone agreed, every Jew agreed, that the Sabbath was to be honored. That wasn't debatable. It was one of the Ten Commandments. It is one of the Ten Commandments, honoring the Sabbath day. The problem was, in the commandment, it said, you shall do no work on the Sabbath. Well, that term, work, is a gray area. What's work? And what's work for you may not be work for me, and vice versa. You may really like cutting your grass. I may hate it. It may not be work for you. 
And so the Pharisees, out of probably good intentions, decided, hey, we're going to try to erase some of that gray area. And so they put in rules and regulations about this is what work is and this is what work is not. And so on and so forth. And by the time of Jesus' day, it had gotten so bad that they treated their rules to the same degree as the Old Testament command. And so they say, why are you doing this? And Jesus' rebuttal is to quote an Old Testament story. Now this is an Old Testament story. You may not be familiar with it. David, from David and Goliath, he's been anointed king and the current king Saul is tired of him. He's jealous, he's frustrated. Saul's kind of losing his grip on reality and he begins to want to kill David. So David drops everything, as you would, and he runs away, leaving everything. Him and his, him and his troops, his guys, leave with him. And they come upon the tabernacle and there's a good priest there named Abimelech. And Abimelech helps him out. He says, here's the sword of Goliath that you want in combat to arm yourself. And here's the bread of the presence. Now the bread of the presence was this loaf of bread that just stayed out in the tabernacle, in the temple as an offering to God. But the priests were allowed to eat of it. But they were the only ones. But David here decides to do it. Now, there's two reasons why Jesus is saying that David gets away with this. The first is that he's the king. He is the anointed king, and the king of Israel was supposed to be the first worshiper, the primary worshiper. Israel was supposed to look at him and be like, that's how you do it. That's how you worship. So he has some interpretive leeway in his engagement with the ceremonial law. The second reason that it's okay is that it's an emergency. This man's life is on the line. He needs nourishment to keep going. And so Jesus is saying that the ceremonial law could be bent or flexed in the issues of life and emergency and flourishing. It wasn't there to crush people. It was there to bring life. It wasn't like David just walked into a worship service and was like, oh, I'm hungry. I'm going to have this. No, his life was on the line. And most people think because Jesus is referring to this story, the story of David on the run probably happened on the Sabbath, which is important. Because on the Sabbath day, the priests would have changed out the bread. Old bread goes away, new bread comes in. So it's probable that Abimelech was just giving him the old loaf. It's like riding up to Krispy Kreme and asking if they're throwing out any donuts so that you can take them to like a homeless shelter or something. It's just the old bread. And Jesus is saying that it is David's authority that gives him the right to do this. Look what it says in verse 8. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. You see, Jesus is claiming a greater authority. He's saying, I'm the greater David. The Pharisees were frustrated by this. Because they wanted the disciples to find their rest either in the day of the week or in the rules that the Pharisees put out. But guess what? They found their rest in Christ and in his authority. And if you're going to find rest, real rest, you have to put your rest in Christ and his his authority as well. This is the difference between your rest leading to flourishing and your rest leading to failure. It doesn't matter what day of the week you rest on. It doesn't matter how long you rest, but your rest will never be restful unless you go to Jesus. He's the Lord of the Sabbath. He's the one that invented it. He's the one who made the heavens and the earth. And on six days he did it. And then on the seventh, he rested. He's the only one who can extend that rest to us. And it's not because he's stingy. And it's not because he doesn't want you to rest. It's because, and this is critical, you can only receive things from God by grace through faith. You have to trust him. We believe that about salvation. Why don't we believe that about rest? You should. 
Because that's what salvation is. Salvation is entering into God's eternal rest for you and for me. That's how it's described in Hebrews. And so if salvation is offered by grace through faith, rest is the exact same thing. It's by grace through faith. Jesus must be the Lord of your Sabbath. He has to be. If you can't get away from your work, if you can't switch off your email for a while, if you're constantly checking it, or you're constantly consumed by the needs that you have and you think that only work can provide for you, then Jesus is not the Lord of your Sabbath. Whatever you can't say no to, that's your Lord of your Sabbath. That's your idol. You see, Jesus wants you to rest, and here's why. It is a statement of faith to rest. It is a statement declaring that God is in control and that all the things you're leaving unfinished, all the needs you perhaps are leaving unmet, you're trusting them to the sovereign care of God's grace. When you rest, you tell your job or your busy lifestyle that you come this far and no further. Rest, a regular habit, a regular schedule of rest is an intentional period of idle destruction. And idols are a lot like weeds. They'll just keep cropping up unless you're pulling them out regularly. And that's what a day of rest is. It is an act to pull out the idols in your life. Because you are proclaiming Jesus as Lord of your time. And for many of us, that's the most precious resource we have, our time. When we give him our time, we are trusting him to give us the nourishment and the fulfillment and the satisfaction that endless productivity promises, but it can't deliver. Now, what I'd like to do with the rest of our time is to spend some practical time talking about what does Sabbath rest actually look like, okay? Because resting in Christ is kind of abstract. And when you're confronted with an abstract concept, it can help to look at something more concrete to understand it. So we just talked about uh, rest sort of embracing God's authority. We also need to talk about how rest elevates work. It elevates work. Look at verse 5. Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. So Jesus gives a second reason why it's okay for the disciples to do what they're doing. It's because of their work. You see, in the Old Testament, the priests actually had jobs to do on the Sabbath. And whether you were a Pharisee or a Sadducee or the Mediterranean Sea, didn't matter. You would qualify that as work. They were doing a job. And the law made an allowance for them to perform work on the Sabbath day. Things like changing out the bread of presence. We just talked about that being a Sabbath responsibility. And what Jesus is saying here is that the disciples are actually doing what the priests were doing because he's saying something greater than the temple is here. And he's talking about himself. You see, what made the temple special was that it was the place where God's presence dwelt on earth. Hopefully you see where I'm going with this. Jesus is the greater temple because he's the son of God incarnate. He is God's presence on earth, in the flesh, dwelling amongst them. And so what Jesus is saying here is that the disciples are actually doing priestly work because they're working for him. They're serving the greater temple. And this is one of the most important things you can realize about work. Work, true work, is working for Christ. It's serving him. It's giving him glory in everything you do, particularly in your job. There's nothing sacred or special about what the disciples were doing. They were walking through a field. But because it was with Jesus, it was sacred and it was special. Work became temple service because it was with Jesus. And this has to be the same for us. 
I don't think we realize how sacred work is. And I don't think that's a work problem. That's a rest problem. Because for us to rest in Christ, or for, excuse me, for us to actually rest, we have to rest in Christ, right? We just talked about that. So for you to actually work, if rest is the cessation of work, then working has to have similar groundings. It's got to be work for Christ. If resting is rest in Christ, then real work is working for Christ in your job. Figuring out, spending time thinking, how does my job give glory to God? I had a pastor uh, several years ago that I heard preach a sermon on rest, and he gave this illustration. He talked about music and the beauty of music. And he said the difference between music and an alarm or noise is that music has coherence and it has sense and logic to it. You can follow it. It's doing something and it changes and it alters. But one of the ways in which you get music to do those things is that you intentionally insert rests. In order to make music, you have to intentionally choose not to make music for a moment. Isn't that so counterintuitive? For music to be enjoyable, for it not to just be this paceless cacophony of, of noise, is you have to stop playing music to make music. For you to work and truly work for God, you've got to stop working. You've got to rest. The reason why you're sitting there right now and you're looking at your job and you're thinking, I don't know how my life, my work gives God glory. My guess is because you haven't taken the time to rest, to go to God and say, God, answer that question for me. And you'll never answer it if you don't rest. Rest elevates our work. It allows us to learn how our service is temple service. So I'm going to give you two practical things when it comes to rest to make your rest fruitful and help you elevate your work. One, guilt is one of the easiest ways to profane the Sabbath. Some of us, we like to work. And when we're not working, we feel guilty. We're worried about who we're letting down, what we could be getting ahead on. Some of it is I could actually be providing for my needs. If I take an extra shift, I could have more. And so we feel guilty when we rest. You are not resting in Christ if you are feeling guilty. And that's with anything. If it's sin, if you've got confession and repentance, if you are feeling shame and guilt following your confession and repentance, you're not resting in his death, burial, and resurrection that forgives you of that sin. Guilt and shame is a clear indication that you are not resting in Christ. So do not have guilt when you rest. Now, I know that's easier said than done. But you have to take that to the Lord. You've got to go to him and say, God, I'm holding on. I'm holding on too tight to it. Take it, Lord. Take it. Secondly, and I'm hesitant to do this, because my rule followers in here, my organized people, if I give you a pattern and a guideline, you have a tendency to make it more than a guideline. But I'm going to give you a guideline. And those of you who are like, oh, okay, whew. it's not abstract. I can figure this out. All right. There's a great book called The TechWise Family by Andy Crouch. It's a real short book that basically gives 10 commandments about how to have technology in your home and how to not let it govern your life. I would recommend it. We've also got a, a link on social media about uh, what his 10 commandments are. But the book is short. Read it. But one of the things he says when he talks about rest is that you should rest one hour a day, one day a week, one week a year. Now he's talking about technology, but many of us work in a field where we can work remotely or we can be accessed via email. So what he's saying is for one hour a day, you are unavailable, which is really doable. And don't do it like from 12 to 8 when you're not or when you're asleep or whatever it is you're <clears throat> Like maybe pick dinner time. Hey, from 6 to 7 or 7 to 8 or whatever it is, I'm with my family. 
and I don't answer my phone. I don't look at my phone. I'll get back to you at 7.01, okay? The one day a week is maybe a little harder. I get that. But you can be creative. The Jews were. Their Sabbath was sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday. You can check that last email at 5.55 on Friday night. Put, a, put on a away message and a away notification. And then check it again Saturday at 5.55. Now the one week a year that's challenging, you'll have to coordinate with employees and employer. But it is something, a guideline to work towards. Where I'm not working, I'm resting. And it's not just taking time. Again, it can't just be, I'm not going to work. It's taking that time, and I think some of it, to intentionally remind yourself of resting in Christ, that he's got this, he's in control, he's in charge. That's what real rest is. It cannot be an absence of something. It has to be an absence so that Christ can fill that space. I will say this, you will never figure out how to rest if you don't ever take the time. Unfortunately, rest is one of those things that you don't get to plan beforehand and then enjoy it. It's something you have to learn how to do. Because as I said, some things that are restful for me are not restful for you and vice versa. So you've got to trust the spirit. There's some trial and error. Use those guidelines I just gave you and trust the spirit to lead you into his rest. Now, one of the things that we talked about when we started discussing rest this morning was how tired we are, and I haven't really addressed that. So let's talk about how rest actually encourages the weary. Rest encourages the weary. Verse 7, and if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. Jesus has a third and final argument why it's okay for the disciples to do what they're doing. And it's based around this idea that doesn't just apply to the Sabbath, but any interaction we have with God. And it's that God eagerly desires to dispense mercy to us. The Pharisees had it backwards. They thought that they could do enough things to make God pleased with them. And Jesus is saying, sacrifice is great, and there's there's honor, and there's some level of, of, of goodness in that, I suppose. Yes, we should make some sacrifices for our relationship with the Lord, truly. But that is not the foundation of the relationship. It is mercy. It is grace. And I know this because of the stories that surround the passages we're in. If you look after this story, there's another Sabbath story, and Jesus heals a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath. That's work. Power is exerted, and he's challenged on it. But he reminds them the Sabbath is for flourishing. It's for life-giving. It's for restoration. That's what the Sabbath is. It's this island in time that reminds us that our God desires that we grow and that we flourish and that we have joy and that we have life. To leave a man unwell on the Sabbath was to violate the Sabbath. The passage before this is hopefully a familiar verse to you. It's one of my favorites. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Jesus tells us to come to him when we're weary. To him. Notice he doesn't say, go to the Sabbath. Notice he doesn't say, get to the weekend and you'll be okay. And that's how some of us live. God, if I could just get through this week. If I could just get through this week. If I could just get through this week. That doesn't sound restful. That doesn't sound like you're flourishing. It sounds like you're surviving. A lot of us live for the weekend. Jesus wants you to come to him when you're worn out, when you need rest, when you're weary. 
because he's the only one that can give you that rest. Because we're all tired. We're all fatigued. You can go home and watch this later if you can't see me. I've got great bags under my eyes. They're beautiful. And here's why you need to go to Jesus. Because you're tired. Because he's the only one who knows what it's like to be weary. And the only one to overcome weariness. And I've said this many times. You've probably heard me say this before. One of my favorite musicians is Andrew Peterson. Andrew Peterson is a phenomenal like Christian kind of folk singer. And he released an album uh, several years ago um, uh, called The Resurrection Letters Prologue. And it's a five-song uh, album, and in the, it basically walks you through Holy Week. And the last song on the album is called God Rested. And the first verse is all about talking about how Jesus was on the cross. They took him down before the, the Sabbath began on Friday night, and they buried him. And he was in the tomb on Friday night and all day Saturday. And he talks about how God, the Son of God, is resting on the Sabbath. He did his work. He finished it. He'd suffered and died for our sins. His work was done and he rested. In the same way that he rested after he created everything, he rested after he rescued everything. But the second verse is even better. Because Mr. Peterson takes us on a journey of other characters in the story. He talks about how Mary is devastated over the death of her son. The Pharisees are terrified that Jesus is actually who he said he was or that the disciples are going to steal his body. Peter's crushed because he betrayed his friend. And then at the end of the song, he says, but God rested. And even though he was dead, he was still in control of everything. That's the kind of God you can rest in with everything you have. A God who is dead and still in control. And this is why Jesus can tell you, I desire sacrifice, oh, sorry, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Sacrifice is important. Sacrifice is necessary. Here's the thing, it's already been paid. The sacrifice part is already covered. The only thing left is mercy. The only thing left to receive is mercy. Here's the crazy thing about following Jesus. Are you ready for this? If you want to follow Jesus, you don't have to work harder. You have to rest. That's what it is. Resting in him. Trusting in him. Putting your faith in him. That he's got it. That his death, his burial, his resurrection is enough. Not putting your faith in being a good person. Not putting your faith in some good things you did. Or balancing your bad things with your good things. Or putting faith in a baptism. Or putting faith in the fact that you walked an aisle one time when you were a kid. It is resting in Jesus Christ. It's putting your faith in him that his work is enough for you. Resting is a proclamation of the gospel. To not rest is a denial of it. You are actively living your life around an intentional reminder that Jesus is all that you need. That's what rest should be. It is designing an interruption, an intentional interruption in your schedule from the busyness and the struggle of living in a fallen world in order to remember that Jesus is enough. It's an intentional interruption. That's what rest is. Whether it's an hour, a day, or a week, that's what it is. Now, I can't tell you how to do this. I promise I'm not abdicating a, a pastoral responsibility here. You have to figure it out. I have given you the ingredients. The Spirit of God is with you. Go bake that cake. You've been given the sheet music. Go play the song of rest in your life. Let your life be music. But to be that, it has to have rest. And it's rest in Christ. And some of you have never done that. 
You've never actually rested in Christ. And I would ask you this question, the same one that we started with, aren't you tired? Aren't you tired of being, being, trying to prove yourself to everybody around you? Aren't you tired of trying to prove yourself to yourself? Aren't you tired of trying to prove yourself to God Almighty? If you're tired, come to him, all who are weary and heavy laden, and let him give you his rest. Because the Sabbath is there for flourishing. It's there for forgiveness. Some of us, the rest of us maybe, maybe have rested in Christ for our eternal salvation, but have not rested in him in the other areas of our life. Y'all, that's what following Jesus is. It is regularly asking the question, how can I rest in Christ in this area of my life, in this area of my life, and in this area of my life? How can I rest in Christ at work? How can I rest in Christ with my family? How can I rest in Christ at church? How can I rest in Christ in this difficult relationship I'm in? How can I rest in Christ? And that's how you grow. You grow by resting and responding to him when he leads. Yes, there's work involved. There will be work, trust me. But you won't know what to do if you're not resting in him. You'll just be flailing about. Like me when I swim. It's not not pretty. Rest in him. Rest in him. Because rest embraces Christ's authority for your life. It elevates what you do, and it'll encourage you when you're weary. So rest. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you for rest. Thank you for interrupting all of human history in order to send your Son to die for us and give us rest, that eternal rest, that timeless interruption that we may have life and have it with you. Lord, I pray for those who are here who do not know you and do not know your rest. May they find it today. And Lord, may we know it deeper and truer than we've ever known it before. And Lord Jesus, it's in your great name we pray. Amen.